Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm joined here with uh, Lisa DeLay. We've uh, been doing this for a good number of months now as we get together and we've moved uh, sites to doing this. So here we are. And um, so ask all of your friends to join in. And we will be rebroadcasting this uh, on this site as well as on all of my uh, social media and uh, podcast sites. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Lisa DeLay and I do a podcast twice a week called Spark My Muse and comes out on Wednesdays and Fridays. And I have guest interviews on Fridays. And then on Wednesdays, I do a shorter segment called Soul School, which is kind of for your interior world and for um, thinking about common life together. And so those are more of reflections that are shorter. But then on Fridays, I have a whole variety of guests and we discuss all sorts of things um, about how to be human and how to be uh, how to deal with emotions and memories and we did one on lucid dreaming we did one on um, the last one was about Ryan J Bell and he went from being a pastor to being an unbeliever and that of course w is a career limiting move <laughs> uh, so then how did he deal with that and what what came next and he had a very popular uh, Huffington Post column called life after God and it was kind of his story about that. And um, I have a whole variety of guests on for that. So, and Chris and I got involved as co-hosts through the Blab platform and decided to co-host together because it's so much more fun to do this mm -hmm. type of platform together than doing it solo and monologuing. Yes. And, uh, and now Chris does a podcast too. Yes. You wanna, you, you still there? I'm still here. Did okay, you why don't you go ahead and, and talk a little bit about what you do, Chris? Yeah, so uh, very appreciative that, you know, I don't just have to uh, talk on and on by myself. It's good to have somebody to talk with. But, um, yeah, I'm a uh, life coach and a counselor. I've been doing that for over 20 years. And I have a private practice and also doing work. And I have my podcast, which is uh, called On Finding Peace. And you can just search that on all of your whatever platforms you for podcasting. I'm on there. So that's uh, the basics of what I'm doing. And today we're looking at anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sorry. Some topics that are, um, I think there's kind of a, there's an election or something. Kind of, I'm not sure. Or, I don't know. People talk about it once in a while, but. Uh, a lot of people are filled with anxiety lately and thinking about doing things that are really sort of are practical for people. Obviously, you're, we're going to deal with anxiety in one form or another for our whole lives. So it's not just a seasonal or circumstantial <laughs> sort of thing that we're doing here. But uh, really, Chris, this is much more of your forte. So I don't know if co-host is that's a little grandiose of a title for me now i should oh, be kind of like the um i'm not sure what title would be appropriate for me but like um you're you're definitely more suited to speak to this than i am but um certainly have found different ways to cope in my own life i could speak from personal experience but i i can't really speak from sort of psychological um training or anything like you can well I think we need to, and, uh, you know, it's one thing for people to hear a psychological viewpoint, but I think it's uh, another thing for people to understand what it's like, uh, you know, just for the lived experience. You know, most people don't get to see a life coach or a counselor. And uh, so I think just, you know, from a, a life experience, how do we cope with anxiety? What, what do we do with it? Um, and you're right, I think uh, anxiety is, is much more prevalent in our world than maybe it's been in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing, um, you know, a lot more unrest in the world and, and with the current elections, which we won't get political on, but is, I think, causing a lot of stress and anxiety. And, and uh, 
I can feel it. And, and I think, you know, a lot of other people are. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. So what are, do people come to you in, in clinical ways uh, and they, and that is at the base of some of the things that they're struggling with or do, does it come out in other kind of symptomatic ways? Do they come and say, I'm just full of anxiety or do you <clears throat> kind of realize that that's underneath other things? What I find in the private practice, people will come for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they'll come and say, you know, that I'm really feeling anxious or I'm totally stressed. Right. And then we have to really look at what's the underpinning, you know, where is this coming from? And is it something that's major? Is it somewhat minor? Uh, you know, well, what can we do with this on a daily basis? Um, my other specialty is addiction. So if I have people coming in uh, who are suffering from various substance, uh, use addiction, or I've dealt with some people with internet addictions, you know, is there an underlying anxiety? And I, I think what we're finding, and not just for my own uh, practice, but when you look at some of the data, is a lot of these substances, especially, is a result of the anxiety. So it's, right. it's a coping mechanism to deal with what's going on in the world and the stressors. Uh, you know, of everyday life, you know, so mm -hmm. people are jumping on that. And, um, you know, we now have in many states the, the legalization of marijuana, you know, which when you talk to people in those states is you know, either good or bad. And, uh, you know, it's just, I think, a way of numbing things versus coping with. So mm -hmm. you know, I'm glad when people come to my office or want to talk online, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because it's always better to deal with it rather than let's just put a bandaid on it, hope it heals, mm -hmm. you know, but every time you rip the bandaid off to check it, it's still not healing. So, yeah. 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 It's a self-medicating thing that can happen. Um, but you don't really, you're not necessarily dealing with any root causes or anything like that. It's just, um, I hope this feels better for now, but. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, cause if I'm feeling stressed and anxious and I don't want to feel stressed and anxious, well, you know, if, if, uh, you know, alcohol or a drug or, you know, whatever will make me feel better, right. then why not do that? And then I'll end up feeling better. And what can it hurt? You know? Right. And there can be really common things too. Like my friend would call it retail therapy <laughs> and, uh, she just goes shopping and if she could get a few clothing items or a couple of, bargains she felt a lot better mm -hmm. at least for a little bit till the next time or food is another really common exactly. one yeah. exactly yeah. and you know yes. here and there i'm not going to dismiss that you know i mean I, i've yeah. been known to buy an electronic item or or you know gadget <laughs> you know but yeah you know i think those are the normal things you know you, you feel extra stress so you do that you know the retail therapy the food whatever Right. It's really the issue when it becomes, you know, part of my life. So, you know, it's every day after work, I'm doing retail therapy, you know, versus the every few weeks. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think that's where it becomes the problem. It's, it's when it's now part of my life. And if I can't get to doing whatever it is that I do, then my stress actually goes up. Right. So, you know, I think. Yeah. If, if the, and if you kind of know this actually doesn't make me feel better, I actually feel a little worse, or I know that the, the anxiety is going to come, come back with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess there's a point where people realize there's um, it's more painful to, to not do something that, about it than to do something about it. And they, they seek help at that point. Um, but when I, I was, I wanted to just say this one thing, and maybe maybe you can unpack it a little bit or mm -hmm. explicate it a little bit for me. But um, that it's it's not. Uh, we think it, we tend to think of anxiety as it's really problematic instead of really really normal. But if you're human, you're going to be anxious because uh, our brains are always predictive, mm -hmm. and when you have a predictive brain, even like a, a dog will have a predictive brain and get anxious about its owner not coming home, for instance, and rip apart the couch cushions, right? Because because of the ability to be predictive, you have the ability to be anxious and forward thinking, and that creates anxiety, whether it's over a looming problem or 
uh, stress about money or stress mm-hmm. about death or you know something or just some sort of doom or who might be leaving your country next or whatever it could be tons of different things or if you can take care of your children um, just that predictive nature of the problem solving mind mm-hmm. will necessitate that we have anxiety kind of perpetually in our lives so i think that the idea of that not to stigmatize anxiety right overall it's like when it becomes where it's really difficult to function then that's different but that just mm-hmm. because we're going to experience some anxiety in our life doesn't mean oh my gosh you know no one has anxiety but me <laughs> and all the really troubled people in the world yeah no and and i appreciate you bringing that up because the way that i look at anxiety is anxiety in and of itself is not the issue it's how we cope with it that can be the issue. So, yeah, I don't know of anybody who can live without any anxiety. Uh, mm-hmm. It really is to the degree and extent that we feel it. It's to the degree that we can cope with it in a healthy way. It's when we're not coping well and it really is becoming something that's unhealthy. Then it's it's a problem. You know, but yeah, your everyday stressors, your everyday anxiety is really not the problem. And there's actually something called positive stress. And there's a term for it called, I I think I'm pronouncing it right, so Uh, eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. And, you know, it's interesting because the only difference between that and any other stress is in the positive stress or the good stress I guess like there's good and bad cholesterol. Um, (laughs) You know, the the only main difference is that the positive stress can help to be a motivator. The positive stress can help push us forward. You know, so, you know, I I don't want to get up and go to work, but the positive stress may be, well, here's what's going to happen if I don't. (laughs) You know, and you start thinking of all those negative things. So that's kind of that, that good stress that says, you know what, life will be better if I just get up and go to work. Yeah. So we, we do need to keep in mind that, you know, not all stress is bad. And like you're saying, you know, we, we don't want to stigmatize stress. I mean, stress actually is mm-hmm. normal and you're going to experience stress, you know, and, and if you right. don't see me because you're either <laughs> remarkable <laughs> and, you know, we, yeah. we need to <laughs> publish this <laughs> or you're totally, you know, in, in delusion that there is no stress in life. <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, and also just like the, like exercise is stress and our bodies are actually made. If you didn't have any, mm-hmm. that would be really negative. And, and our bodies are made to, to deal with a lot of like inputs like that on our, you know, we have these adrenaline responses and mm-hmm. if you never had them, you, your immune system wouldn't get engaged. And so there's different things that if you have prolonged, it's the prolonged stress that isn't dealt with that tends to be the, this thing that, um, can be really negative, but the little bursts of stress once in a while, like for exercise, you, uh-huh. it's obviously a different kind of stress and, um, even just the troubles that come in an ordinary life, right. but it's that like really persistent. Like if you're, if you ha- are in a really high tension, stressful job for years and your blood pressure is high uh-huh. and there's, there's a lot of abuse at work or whatever, that's when you can get really ill right. and, uh, your your cortisol levels just are sustained high. I think that's kind of, you know, that's the thing we're trying to avoid. Like that's mm-hmm. the, the practical stuff we're trying to talk about that for whatever reason, you can't get away from it and you need to be able to manage it or um, find a way, a workaround or something like mm-hmm. that. Uh, but yeah, just the normal stress, like I, I that um, that dream of the stress-free job or the stress-free life mm-hmm. on a hammock, is is really either we would be bored by it mm-hmm. or it it sounds like a dream come true but if we experienced it it actually would be like this is not doing anything for me yeah. <laughs> like it was cool for two weeks right. and now i'm totally like almost looking to be stressed out <laughs> well because then what would be my motivation to do anything you know so if, if there was no stress i wouldn't have any motivation for anything and you know like you say you know uh, you might be able to lay in a hammock and 
do nothing for, you know, a day or a few days, and, and that might be healthy for you. But over time, if you have no reason to remove yourself from the hammock, then, well, yeah, what is the point of being here? You know, it, it's just w- what is life. And, and I do think that's where some of, you know, when you look at the natural world, you know, some of the pain that we would experience, which gives us some of the stress, also lets us know that there might be a problem. You know, so if I'm laying in that hammock for days because I have no motivation to move or do anything, well, the hunger pains are eventually going to stress me out that, you know, like I'm laying here, I'm not at peace anymore because these hunger pains won't go away. So that's going to make me (laughs) do something about the hunger pains, uh, you know, which hopefully is get some nutritious food and then they go away and I've, you know, taken care of my body. So, yeah, are, are we listening to our bodies? Are we not listening to our bodies? But you know, the, the point being, we're not going to eliminate stress. It, it's it's just not going to go anywhere. But, you know, if, if I look at stress and, and say to myself, well, you know, let's just avoid it. Let's just ignore that it's happening. That's when the stress is going to become a problem because it's just going to build and build and build. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, it'd be the same thing if you have a pain somewhere and you just ignore that pain, ignore that pain. Eventually, you're going to have to confront that. Is it's not going to get better by ignoring it. Mm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, what are some of your practical ideas that you've come up with to, as you advise people or as you've used them yourself? Well, the the first one that I always try to let people know is what we've just been talking about. That it's normal. Don't think that you have a mental disorder. Don't think that you're different or you're weird. It's normal. We're all going to have stress. I don't care what you do in life. It's going to happen. So part of what I try to do is just normalize it. And what we've been talking about is, is what I'll instruct, uh, you know, people on. But then the other thing, you know, it has to go back to it's kind of my, you know, rant that I talk about in every podcast is back to mindfulness. You know, part of what, when we feel that stress is to live in the moment, you know, and and refocus our minds to the present moment, because even living in a stressful moment is not fun. And I want to avoid it. But if I focus my mind to it, then I can start to look at what maybe some of the causes are and what are some of the healthy things that I can do to reframe my life so that maybe I won't be stressed in the next moment. And and that I think becomes in a healthier way than just avoiding it, you know, and, and to just recognize it's happening. Now what? Mm-hmm. Once we can try to find out where my stress is coming from, then we can really get into the practical steps. Because a lot of times what I find is the stress is coming about because of our expectations. And a lot of times they're unrealistic expectations. Right. If we can really focus ourselves on, you know, what do I expect out of myself? What do I expect out of my loved ones? What do I expect out of life? We really need to refocus those and make sure that, that they are things which are doable. Mm-hmm. So when they don't happen the way we expected it, we're you know not going to get all stressed if, you know, we realize these are realistic. So it, it probably shouldn't go wrong. And then if it does go wrong, we can maybe figure out another way to work it. But just to realize that if my expectations are unrealistic, they're not going to be met. And I am going to have stress and anxiety when they're not met, you know, unless I change what those expectations are. That's good. Trying, trying to tweet out some more stuff. It looks like we don't have too many extra people joining us today, but um, let's see here. Yeah, one of the things that I was coming to, um, my thoughts, coming in my thoughts about some of the ways that have helped me cope is just kind of planning ahead in terms of, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm kind of a, I don't think about planning. I'm just kind of, I just kind of roll with things. But in terms of just like, having a calendar out like i kind of have to have one out because of there's four people in our family and 
they all we all have things going on, doctor's appointments and obligations. And so we have a monthly calendar on the refrigerator and it doesn't really nothing changes in t terms of like what's going to happen, and, but it helps me to not forget things and so we write things down. But then in terms of just planning for those things and knowing that they're coming. And so, so some amount of planning helps in terms of dealing with anxiety and just kind of being mentally prepared, certain amount of planning uh, because some, sometimes the surprises are the things that are the most stressful and dealing with things that seem unforeseen. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, just getting like, um getting your game face on in, in terms of like mentally being like i know there's things that are going to come up this month it's like this this <laughs> like um gang psyched up about it like all right this is going to be a tough month mm -hmm. because there's you know these five things coming up i'm going to be uh having this meeting and i'm going to be you know we're going to be taking a trip here and everything's going to be okay it's going to be tough here and it just kind of like Instead of heading into a month or next few weeks thinking, I hope all this gets done and oh, this could be really hard and oh, I have, we have to meet with this person and kind of getting like, oh, it's coming mm -hmm. and there's dread. Just knowing like, we've had hard months before. It's going to be fine. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be tough. But like, it's it's almost like you're rehearsing in your mind that kind of planning. Like, I don't mean right. planning in terms of, sure, planning in terms of details, mm -hmm. but like planning how you'll handle it when it comes like right. mentally like um because i've tended to uh almost at, at times just you're kind of like oh no what's next is what else, other bad thing and surprise is going to happen and just mm -hmm. to kind of be rehearsing like yeah there's going to be some surprises and there's going to be a couple hard days and you'll, i'll be tired but whatever comes is going to be okay and mm -hmm. when it comes i'm going to react in a way that it's gonna be. It's gonna be fine. Ultimately, I'm still here. We've had we've yeah. had tough months. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else or ever will, but that's one of those things that has only come living live, with lived out experience. Right. And that that was that's a recent thing that that's. Um, uh -huh. I guess I would be happy that I've lived this long enough to experience that. <laughs> but um, and, and I think that, the, that's a wonderful kind of way to helped. work it. Mm hmm. <clears throat> Yeah. And, and so when I'm saying planning for upcoming things, I really mean that mental game. Right. And in some of it's mindfulness, like you're, you're thinking of distance with responding instead of reacting, you know, you're, I'm right. going to be responding to things that are coming and having, I, hopefully having distance. That doesn't mean it's going to happen every time, obviously, yeah. but, um, but knowing like, okay, I know that like the, there was a couple of weeks ago, and there were all these dentist appointments and doctor's appointments just crunched into one week. And I don't know why and how that even happened, but it was a terrible idea. And I had to run here and run there and take two kids at the same time and for a different thing. And I was just not looking forward to it. And I knew it was going to just be, just wear me out. Mm -hmm. But, but it couldn't really be another way because if once I started canceling and changing things, I would just have to do it all over again the next week. Right. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, yep. Okay. So we're going to do it. We're going to get through this week and it's going to be okay. And we just got to, just got to power through. And I'm not going to just like go kicking and screaming into this week or kicking and screaming into this day and dreading it the whole time. Cause that takes a lot of mm -hmm. like mental psychic energy to, to dread things too. Yep. And you might as well just at least be neutral toward it. <laughs> um, and I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else, but that's to me as a kind of, uh, mindfulness practice. It was mm -hmm. just um, being ready for surprises that come in mm -hmm. a way that I'm going to be okay. Um, almost like thinking of yourself as water. Uh, I, I heard this in a podcast too recently, thinking of yourself as like water can be very strong mm -hmm. in hydropower and in like boring holes through stone eventually, yeah. but it's also very fluid and can take the shape of anything that's it, that it's in thinking of, you know, I can, I could take, I could be flexible, but still strong. And, you know, it's those kind of things of thinking of yourself in different ways than maybe you used to, um, mm -hmm. that you were a victim of your circumstances or that you're just going to get like washed in this flood of like, you know, hectic, chaotic life instead of thinking, okay, 
bring it on. I mean, yeah. I don't want it to just, I don't want to get like overwhelmed with tragedies or something, but like, no, no. but I think I can, you know, I'm going to be, we're going to be able to handle it. We're going to just figure it out. And the next problem comes, we're going to just try to figure it out. But the anticipation <laughs> of worrying of the next event mm -hmm. is what really zaps your energy. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really like how you're saying that because where you look at the mindfulness where, you know, it would say it, you don't want to dwell in that future and make all these very specific plans and because you know we don't know what the future is but never does it talk about nor what i say you know don't prepare in in that sense of what you're talking about because if, if you can go into any situation but let's even just say life in general you know i, I just go into life you know I, tomorrow is going to happen what is my mental view of that you know, am I looking at tomorrow with dread? Am I looking at tomorrow, you know, with happiness, with, with a positive outlook? That's going to change how whatever happens to me, how I react to it. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I'm looking at tomorrow, which is Monday, and you know, saying, oh, great, it's Monday, and it's going to be horrible, and this and that, then <laughs> no matter what happens tomorrow, I'm going to view it as negative. My mindset is negative. I'm waiting for the negative to happen. Even if a positive happens, I'm probably going to see it from a negative because that's what I'm looking for. But if I can go into it with that positive, I might see anything that happens tomorrow from more of that positive viewpoint and say, you know what, I can tackle this. And why can I tackle this? Just as you said, because I've tackled things before. Mm -hmm. You know, so using our history to say I've gotten through stressful things in life before. This isn't my first stress experience. So mm -hmm. what did I do before? Let's try it again, and whatever I need to tweak, I'll tweak for this very specific, uh, you know, experience. Mm -hmm. But we actually do have a question, and uh, oh, really? Yes, it I shows guess up I can't on see this. my screen. Is actually, it... I can pop it on oh, screen for everyone. It's Rhiannon. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it'll go away in a moment. Um, Thanks, Rhiannon. Yeah, so I, I think this is a, a very good question. So, you know, when dealing with anxiety in healthy ways, uh, can those ever lead to escapism from reality? Too much of a good thing, in other words. Oh, it's a very good question. Way to go. Cool, cool. <laughs> so any thoughts on escapism if we're dealing with it in a healthy way? Well, I think it's like a lot of things that, that are really, really good as long as they're not like medicated, medicating. Like um, that, there's no problem with it really, because it, I think our it's our imagination is is a great tool for for relaxation. For you know, it's it's a it's all part of what we're given as gifts to help us get through life. And you know, sense of humor is fantastic tool. Mm -hmm. uh, imagination, fantasy, it's all good. But it's just when that is used as a way to um, separate ourselves from people on a regular basis, or if it's used as uh, just medication, like I really don't want to deal or with issues or people or con confront things, and I'm just going to escape to my world uh, as a means of just any other thing, because you can escape to a bottle, um, can escape to you know and it's yeah escapism can it's like that fine line of how do you know when it's escapism i guess mm -hmm. um yeah. i guess that's that's going to be different for every person and and i think you know in, in looking at the question that if you're truly using healthy ways and uh as Rhiannon put in the the question you know like if you're doing meditation or you know other things that that are healthy I think if your mindset is that healthy coping with, then I think you can't have escapism. That that the escapism comes when you're not trying the healthy. The the escapism is the unhealthy. So, I think in in the nature of the question, you know, that if your focus is I want to deal with this anxiety. And I, I think as long as it does stay healthy, and, and like you're saying, you know, we're, we're not going to hit the bottle or drugs or whatever. But, you know, if we're going to use coping techniques that we think are healthy for us and we want to do it in a healthy way, you know, that we, you know, we're saying, I want to hit this head on. I don't think we can have escapism if that's what we're doing. 
because the escapism for me is, is more of that mental outlook, you know, that I do, I, I'm almost consciously saying I want to escape from this and therefore I'm going to do certain things to make mm-hmm. sure I escape. And, and I, I don't know of too many people that would use meditation as an escape. Because so I, I don't think it would work. You know, I, I think mm-hmm. you'd start doing it if you're not doing it for the right reasons. I, I think it's going to be too painful. Uh, mm-hmm. to just the, the rigor of doing an actual meditation is just, mm-hmm. you know, been there, done that. So it's, I, I, <laughs> yeah, cause I'm waiting for somebody to challenge that. You know, well, I can meditate well, as a way of escaping. Well, okay, but yeah. I, I don't think it's going to work for too long, though. Well, yeah, and I think things like fantasy imagination can all fit under and meditation for sure can all fit under self-care. I, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's going to make sense to anybody, but self-care and anxiety uh, mitigation, I think is totally, uh, totally goes hand in hand, but yeah. self-care is one of these misunderstood things that people either feel guilty about taking proper care and time out for themselves or they um, will kind of go overboard and be sort of, egoist about it and mm-hmm. and be like um self-serving with it or something like that self-care and it, it'll get like flip-flopped onto like selfishness but mm-hmm. but real self-care would just be like anything you would have recommended to, that someone else would do for the good of themselves and right. and so meditation is, is self-care because you're really mm-hmm. able to feel a lot better later but not in a way that would make you addicted to meditation i mean you would you would do it just like you would do exercise and it would be right. you'd feel really good later but it was also it was also tough you know mm-hmm. and i think some of that some of the other things that are disciplines um you know work in work in a similar fashion right but um yeah i i don't really see any of the healthy ways you know becoming escapism i, I think in some ways you could almost become addicted to some of those healthy ways but that's when you would need to understand, you know, what, what is the the purpose of, of what I'm doing? You know, so, you know, like if exercise is running my life versus me doing exercise yeah. to have a better life, yeah. then, okay, maybe there's some addiction going on to, you know, what you're doing. But yeah, ultimately, um, I would encourage people to, to try to do what you can do to cope with uh, your daily anxiety. And if you're trying to actually cope with it, you're not escaping from it. If you're yeah. using substances or the internet or, or anything else to avoid coping with the anxiety, uh, that would be an escapism, you know, because you just don't want to deal with, uh, you know, reality for what it is. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's kind of a has a repressive quality. Mm-hmm. So, like one one thing you could do for like a meditative creative practice to deal with anxiety would be like journaling, right? Mm-hmm. So, at the end of the day, it could be meditative, and you could be like, you know, here's some things I was thinking in the day, and here's some cathartic things. I'm just I'm gonna get them out, or I'm just gonna reflect on my day, pull a few nuggets out, and there'd be a discipline to it, and maybe once a day, or maybe three times a week. It would also have a self-care element, Mm -hmm. but would it be escapism? Not really, because it's kind of this discipline practice. And I guess if you were journaling like, you know, for hours and it was taking away from important connections with people, but I've never heard of anybody like, Mm -hmm. yes, I journal like an addict and a maniac, you know, I mean, just, it just kind of doesn't happen because of, the way in which it's done and i've never heard of that although i'm sure i'm sure it's just because i haven't <laughs> talked to enough people yet <laughs> there's um, always an exception to the rule yeah there's like you can overdo anything you know you can you can overdo brushing your teeth i, I know because they're like easy on the gums you know you think you're doing you think you're doing something good for yourself and healthy and they're like too much too much brushing and you're like what really? that's possible right. um so well, obviously you, so can, you can't do a good thing too much but um but something like, you know, creative practices that are self-care, that are, that are habitual, that, 
-hmm. you know, I think, I think that we kind of usually intuitively know, am I shoving something down? Right. Am I pushing something down, which then it'll just pop up in these other spots. It'll pop up some where else it's sort of hidden and unrecognizable or barely recognizable or not at all recognizable to us. Mm -hmm. And it'll, it'll come out in a, in a poisonous way. And, and I think a lot of it deals with the motivation to, you know, really notice why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, so like you say, yeah. you know, journaling is a very good thing for people to do. And really with today's technology there, you know, you can do audio journaling, video journaling, you know, if you don't want to write, you know, but yeah, if, if you're doing that journaling for that idea of putting my day together and, you know, kind of seeing what's happening within my day, that's a great motivation. You know, if that motivation is, you know, I just don't want to spend time with my family, so I'm going to tell them I'm journaling because I have to It's self-care, <laughs> you know, your whole motivation is off, you know, and, and, and you're not going to get the result, you know, well, the result might be avoiding the family, but you're not getting the other result that you want. Um, but I, I think with self-care, and, and as you had alluded earlier, you know, a lot of people don't look to self-care as something that we would do because that's selfish. And I, I speak to a lot of professional groups on self-care and, and it's hard to have helpers understand that you need to help yourself. Mm. And I know I, I've been there, done that. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I'm not, you know, saying from anything, you know, high up or whatever, but one of the things that it struck me and, and I finally got this and it was only a few years ago, you know, if you fly, and you hear those safety instructions, which I don't listen to because, you know, okay, you know, your seat becomes a flotation device or whatever. It's like, fine. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to remember this when the airplane hits the water. <laughs> you know, I'm going to remember exactly what I need to do because you told me an hour ago, you know, when I was calm. But one of the things that always struck me is when they would say, you know, if you lose the cabin pressure, the oxygen mass come down. And if you're traveling with little children, put yours on first. And I'm thinking, if I'm traveling with my younger child, which I don't have young ones anymore, but if I, you know, when I was driving with younger, why am I going to put on an oxygen mask and watch them struggle to breathe? Like, to me, that was totally selfish. Like, of course, I'm going to put the mask on them first because I, I want them to survive this. But it really struck me when you look at the self-care because you figure I'm going to be panicking. I mean, if those things drop, whether I can breathe or not, I'm panicking because something's wrong if they dropped. And you got a kid who's now freaking out because everybody's freaking out. If you're struggling to get the mask on the kid because the kid is struggling and freaking out, what if you pass out before you get the mask on them? See, and, and when I began to look at that, then I realized that neither of us are being saved. Where if I'm calmer, hopefully as the adult, I can get my mask on and breathe well. Even if my kid passes out momentarily, I can get that mask on and there's not going to be any damage done. So I need to be calm and getting the oxygen to get them the oxygen or else maybe neither of us is getting the oxygen. And who is that serving? Mm -hmm. Have a look at that for that self-care. You know, mm -hmm. if we don't take care of ourselves, who are we going to end up being able to help? Yeah, yeah. So. That's so true. And and it's it's often the people in, in helps professions, like doctors and nurses mm -hmm. and um, teachers and missionaries and pastors and, and people like in the helps fields, they will just go and go and go and then psh, burn out. And, yeah, exactly. and they kind of know better, but they, there isn't like a check in on them or they're not really taking an inventory and some of them will burn out first and then they'll be like, oops, mm -hmm. we shouldn't do that again. And it, it happens that the, I'm going to be doing, I hope next year I have to, I have to, finalize things but um doing a soul school field trip and um it happens that the people who set up this retreat area had a burnout situation in their family mm. and with with someone who's in a helps profession just mm. went too hard too long 
and couldn't do it anymore and had to rest. And it's like, if you don't make time for it, then you like have to make time for your illness or your sickness or whatever it is, uh-huh. because it will catch up to you eventually and, and tear you down. And, and sometimes then that has these big, big repercussions on your family and, and your finances and other things yeah. because you've just gone way too far. And then what about the people you've been taking care of? And then, you know, there's these, there's mm-hmm. these like ripple effect going oh, on because here you, you know, here you've like, if you're putting in your life to helping people, even if it's volunteering, even if it's mm-hmm. caring for your children or, I mean, there's a host of things this could, this could relate to. And then what happens to them? So, so it's wow. like, if you don't do it, like even, and, and people can really make you feel guilty for doing that. Like what are you, you're wasting time in a retreat. Mm-hmm. That seems like that seems like a waste of and it's like but i need to take care of myself this is like a mental health day i i you know you sleep at night for your to rest your mind and your body but sometimes you need to rest like your brain from just going and you you need to just completely chill down away from your environment and away from the the problems like that seem to sort of get embodied in your home or or whatever Mm -hmm. and and so um, when I've tried to get people to come on retreat with me, uh, they'll be like, but what do you do? And, and then they'll, and I, if I describe it, it seems like a complete waste of time. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you walk around, you mm-hmm. write something, you know, maybe read a book a little bit or mm-hmm. you could do some prayer or, you, you know, just meditate. And they'll be like, but then when they do, they're like, I have, you know, like, I have stuff to do. I have a job or I, you know, mm-hmm. I've got things going on. Uh, but then when they come, they're like, oh, now I have the energy to do all that stuff. And they yeah, realize exactly. how less pulled in different directions their brain is. Now they could just go boom and they just can get a ton more done productivity wise because mm-hmm. they're not frazzled. And it's not even and I don't recommend doing it for, for just productivity. That's just an, you know, right. an added benefit. But people don't realize how tired they are until they take a break. And the first couple of times I did a retreat, I completely fell asleep because Mm -hmm. I was just completely exhausted. And I I take my naps anyway. But but it's just like you don't really realize how much you're going and then you stop and it catches up with you. And uh, just being able to take a break from your surroundings, even if, and just maybe even for two or three hours. It doesn't have to be the week long retreat or weekend. No, it's do what you can do. Yeah. It could just be a walk and, um, you know, over a lunch hour, but like really, really get away from notifications on your phone and from anybody, nobody's allowed to call you and you're allowed to not work on anything. You you get like a permission slip or whatever, (laughs) and you can actually downshift. And I think that in terms of anxiety, because you can check into the anxious stuff immediately later you know you're gonna go right back to it but in terms of like self-care and getting getting a permission slip to check out of all your anxious thoughts for just a bit a couple hours they'll all be there waiting for you later anyway so you might as well just like all right well i'm gonna section this time off um for what i need to do to to get give myself a break a real break it's just and people don't necessarily think about it but people in the helps profession who are always doing for others uh, won't really think, but, but what about my care? Mm-hmm. What about what do I need? Yeah, and, and, you know, we normally don't, and you see the burnout big time. And, you know, I think a lot of what you're talking about where the, the problem comes in, you know, is we do live in a society that values output. So, yeah, yeah when you say, well, we're going to meditate and we'll pray and we'll walk and we'll nap and we'll, you know, read – you know, it's like, well, what's the output? You know, well, how is this productive? You know, well, what, what do I do? You know, and for me, what, what I've told people and, and, you know, even just for a day, you know, like, like I say, just take a day that, that you can maybe turn off everything and just say, look, you know, I, I'm just like, get away from it all. Mm-hmm. But if you want to feel productive, and if that's ingrained in you that, you know, well, I need to accomplish something in my day. Mm-hmm. My suggestion would be is every day, mark down a couple goals that you're going to meet in that day. And when you meet those goals, then you've done what you said you're going to do, which means you're productive. So if you're taking a day 
then your goal that day is I'm going to read and I'm going to nap and I'm going to meditate and I'm going to walk. If you did all of those, didn't you accomplish what you were going to do? So in, in, in my mind, you were very productive that day. It wasn't a waste of time because those were your goals. Mm-hmm. You reached your goals. Mm-hmm. Day is done. No different than any other day with any other goals. Right. So, you know, I think if we just reframe the way that we can look at that, then maybe we can help people understand the importance of doing that. You know, or else we are going to burn out, you know, and the anxiety is going to take over. You know, I mean, the, mm-hmm. there's times when, you know, it's it's hard to get up and not because I'm depressed. It's just I'm actually that tired. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're just going and going and going. And eventually the body mm-hmm. says, no, I'm not going to let you. <laughs> right. Right. And and there's all kinds of there's all kinds of related like health issues that, that come up after pushing yourself too hard. Right. And I think. um we don't realize that it's essentially, I don't know if, I don't know, I wish I could remember where I heard this, but <clears throat> there's like a lot of, you know, pathogens and, and diseases that are rooted really originally in stress. Mm-hmm. And um, you could say there's, there's bacteria involved, obviously there's things going on in certain things, but ultimately your, your um, immune system is, is not able to do its job. Mm-hmm. And it's very likely that it just, it, it couldn't because it wasn't ready, right. you know, it couldn't handle it. You know, obviously we're not talking about every single disease or every single flu or everything like that. But a lot of times it's that your body maybe in, in its peak could handle it, mm-hmm. but you know, things will happen. Like I, I know my mom has had terrible inflammation problems and that's usually when your body is attacking itself yeah. and that's really not, so, and sometimes that's that's a genetic issue, and sometimes that's a combination of environmental factors and stress and genetics, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then you wind up having added allergy problems, and you know, and then it's really hard. Then you need the medications, and those have side effects, and so you can wind up having these problems with an inability to cope with stress mm-hmm. and anxiety, <clears throat> and just it stacks and stacks and stacks, and the next thing you know you're really having a hard time with your life and it's not getting easier. <laughs> you know, you're, now you have more exactly. things to actually be anxious about. Yeah. And, and, you know, in our modern world, we've gotten so far away from the natural world that we do ignore those signs within our body. You know, mm-hmm. that when you actually feel physically feel the stress in your body, you've actually been stressed for quite some time. You know, the problem is we don't recognize what feeling stressed is until Mm -hmm. something's physical. And even then we we might blow it off as, you know, well, it's this, or I'll take a pill for this, or it's, you know, that it's really our our body's way of of saying, you know, this is too much and and this is the pain. This is what I'm, I'm showing you. You know, you've got to change your way. So if we don't realize it emotionally, the body's going to let us know. Mm. So I think part of, you know, when we say, you know, what what are some practical ways to cope with this? I think one of the things is try to discover within your own body, what is your physical reaction to stress? Mm. I mean, it, it would be great if you knew what your stress was on a daily basis before it became physical. But... Mm. What is that physical expression of it? And and it's different for different people. But what mm-hmm. is it in you? Because when you mm-hmm. start feeling that, ruling out any other medical cause, you're stressed about something. You know, and, and even if your first thought is, oh, I, I don't have stress. I, you know, everything is great. No. Spend a moment, <laughs> find a quiet place, and figure it out. There, there's probably mm-hmm. something and even if it's not something happening in your life at the moment, maybe you are focused on a future event and you're just really caught up there. And, and the more that you're caught up there, the more it's causing you the stress. So it may not be your current life. You could look at current life and say, life is great. Why, why would I be stressed? Hmm. But you're focused elsewhere. That's, hmm. you know, maybe why you're stressed. Um, yeah. But our bodies tell us things. If, if we want to take the time to hmm. really examine what's going on inside of us. 
Yeah, that is so true. I think what, what you're saying about that, that's why it helps to quiet down and listen to your body and meditate mm -hmm. in terms of just being quiet and say, what do I feel in my body right now? Because usually it just starts out as just discomfort. Your body yeah. will feel just discomfort first. By the time it feels pain, that's a problem. <laughs> like, and I can speak for myself. I'll hold my tension in my neck, and I think that's what will give me tension headaches, mm -hmm. and sometimes migraines, and and sometimes the migraines are just this weird, extra stuff. I don't even know what's going on. But I also hold, you know, a lot of us hold stress in our gut, and mm -hmm. we have digestive issues, or we'll hold it in different different parts of like we'll maybe scrunch up our toes or something like that, or for me, sometimes I'll I'll feel a tightness in my chest, like an asthmatic tightness, yep. but I won't even realize it till I'll be like really out of breath, and I'll be like, <sighs> you know, and then I'm like, by then it's really pretty bad and built up. But what if I yep. checked in a few times a day first and say, mm -hmm. how am I feeling right now? Can I get from just in my head to inside my body, right. and like do a check in, like mm -hmm. reintegrate my head into my body and feel yeah. what what is my body feeling as my tense because what happens if we just disintegrate mind uh, you know brain and body is that by the time we know the body's like crying out with these signals mm -hmm. i'm sending pain now because you've ignored yeah. this and you have not you're out of control you know at that mm -hmm. point there's a problem and pain is an alert to that yeah. problem and uh, you've missed the you've missed the little sign, so we'll send you a big sign. And I think that's that's true because nobody's paying. You know, we're not paying attention. There's no awareness there. No, we we don't notice nature around us. We don't notice our body's reaction to nature. We don't notice ourselves anymore because you know everything is so data driven and pill driven. You know, mm -hmm. if I have a pain, I'm going to take a pill for it. Now, yeah. for a, a truly life and death medical issue, okay, I, I got you. I'm, you know, I'm not anti-pill. But we do need to understand that sometimes those pains in our body is not a medical pill-needed condition. It's a learn to breathe, cope with anxiety, focus on the present moment, and that some of those pains may go away. Mm -hmm. You know, because what you described are, are common you know, symptoms of panic attacks or even just less, just noting, you know, that, that here's a problem. And it's mm -hmm. the body's way of telling you, you've been stressed out and slow it up. And even if you take, you know, a couple of in the day to do that check-in, it can take you a minute or less. You know, we're, we're not talking, you know, find 10 minutes and, and you know, do this formal meditation. Even in the busyness of your day, if you're running to a meeting, can you stop for less than a minute and do a quick check-in of where are you? And any muscles that are tense, loosen them up. Figure out what's going on. But we can do that. Yeah. And just just like I'm gonna really breathe deeply for two minutes. That's not gonna that's not gonna be this big game changer in your day where you're late suddenly late for everything. No. Um, I I I think we'll just forget that we are human, you know, we're, we're human <laughs> beings with bodies, I guess, mm -hmm. um, because we're thinking a lot, we're thinking in the future. And I, I sh I'm just speaking for myself really, because I'm, I'm in the future a lot, anticipating mm -hmm. into intuitive and trying to predict. And then I'll be like, ow, my ow, ow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I guess yeah. we're close to the we're close to rounding out the hour, and I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to cover, but I'll have to get out of here at nine. Yep. Yeah, no. Um. I think uh, we've really looked at this and hopefully help people out as to what are some of the practical things. And I like how we're ending with the natural. I, I think that is so important. Uh, you know, for us to understand what our bodies are about, what they're telling us, and to actually listen to them. And, mm -hmm. and that's going to make a world of difference. If we do it on a daily basis, odds are we're not going to get totally stressed. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so hopefully if you're listening and you haven't heard my podcast, come here, sparkmymuse.com mm -hmm. or on iTunes, Spark My Muse. And make sure to check out Chris and what he's up to. Reminder, 
Lee again, which, which, where, how to find you. <laughs> yeah, for me, you can go to my website, lifesjourneyblog.com, and uh, you'll find all the links you need to everything there. And if you are on whatever podcast uh, app you like, just search for On Finding Peace, and that's where you'll find my podcast. And uh, thank you, Lisa. Another great conversation. And uh, this is awesome. And I look forward to our next. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much, Chris. All right. Have a great night. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.